Chapter 4, Expedition of Shopping and the Little Friend of the Governess On the night of that intense encounter with Lord Melbourne, Victoria could not sleep, thinking again and again about everything he had said to her. Victoria did not know why, but the genuine pain she saw in Lord Melbourne gave her a great sadness, and words of him about his memories caused Victoria great uneasiness. She did not quite understand why she felt she was part of Lord Melbourne's pain. The man's gaze disturbed her, made her shudder, it was a very intense look, which seemed to reflect a great inner storm, a look that mixed pain with longing, nostalgia and love. Of course it was absurd, but that when those green eyes so beautiful for her lay on Victoria, she felt she was undressed, her soul and something else. Do not be dumb, Victoria. Lord Melbourne is your patron, and he sees you as a servant, he is only heedful with you, for he is obviously a charming man, thought Victoria. But his sadness. Why so sad? Those beautiful eyes do not deserve so much pain. She shook her head and sat up in bed. She was definitely acting like a silly little girl. Victoria put her bare feet on the ground and stood up. She lit a lamp and then reached for her homemade robe and put it on top of her nightshirt. With her long loose hair, and walking slowly with the lamp in her hand so as not to trip, she opened the door and started to leave the bedroom. But as soon as she opened the door and put her feet out of the bedroom, she saw something that startled her. The bedroom door next door was open, and standing on the threshold of the door were Miss Scarrett and a man Victoria had already met along with the rest of Brockett Hall's servants, he was the mansion cook, Mr. Charles Elm Francatelli. Mr. Francatelli and Miss Scarrett were kissing each other's lips. When they both saw Victoria, they quickly moved away from each other, and they saw her in surprise and shame. Obviously, a man coming out of the bedroom of a woman in the middle of the night, both dressed only in their nightwear and sharing a passionate kiss on the farewell lips, clearly indicated the type of relationship they had. But the three did not have time to react, for they felt footsteps approaching and then Miss Scarrett and Frank Catelli hurried into the bedroom and closed the door. Eliza Scarrett had time to make a gesture to Victoria begging for silence. Victoria waited frightened and saw that the one approaching was Mrs. Lazen. Miss Victoria, what are you doing out of your bedroom at these times? Asked Mrs. Lazen, surprised and in a tone that demanded explanation. It's just. I was thirsty, very thirsty. And I wanted to go to the kitchen to get some water, Victoria replied, a little nervous, but trying to keep her composure. I see, but Miss Victoria, did not they put a little pitcher in her bedroom to fill it with water every night and not have to leave? Lazen asked. Yes, of course, forgive me, I forgot to fill it. I'm very clumsy, I'm sorry, Victoria replied. All right, I understand said Mrs. Lazen with a cold face, but in a friendly tone, but do not forget in the future, one of the rules I have strictly enforced is for the household employees not to leave their bedrooms from the time the lights went out and we all retired to sleep. The only person who can freely walk the house at that hour is my Lord Melbourne, but of course, he owns the house and can do whatever he wants. Yes, of course, it will not be repeated, Mrs. Lazen. Victoria said apologetically. Do not worry, now bring your pitcher, I'll accompany you to the kitchen, Lazen said. Thank you very much, Mrs. Lazen, Victoria replied. The next day, Miss Scarrett took an opportunity to remain alone with Victoria, and apologized for putting her in a compromising situation, and justified herself by her conduct. Do not worry Eliza, you do not have to give me explanations. Really, Victoria said, embarrassed. But I want to give it you, Victoria. I do not want you to think badly of me. Mr. Francatelli is my fiancé, and we plan to get married when we have enough money, although we are going to need a lot more time, for our wages and our expenses. In addition, Charles has the dream of setting up his own business, for the two of us and the family we want to form. But we are very much in love and you know that passion leads us to behave recklessly. But it is not our intention to disrespect this house, 
but the passion has been greater than our wisdom, said Miss Scarrett ashamed. I understand it Eliza, if something taught me my experience in Lowood is not to judge people. I grew up hating the cruelty of some of our caretakers in Lowood, who judged us of mean and unfair way, and treated us cruelly, as if all girls were the worst offenders, the scum of society, and not just some girls who had the misfortune to be born poor or orphans. I believe more in a compassionate God than in a vindictive or relentless God, but you should be careful, Eliza, because Mrs. Lazen is not so comprehensive, Victoria replied. I know. You do not know how I wish I could get married tomorrow. When you are in love and you have chosen a man to spend the rest of life at his side, it is desperate to have to wait to marry him and have your own place to call home. Have not you ever fallen in love, Victoria? said Eliza Scarrett more relieved. Me? No. I have not met any man who interests me and who he interested about me, Victoria blushed and she did not know because she remembered the look of Lord Melbourne. Well, that always happens when you least expect it, said Miss Scarrett, and she saw Victoria with a sympathetic and sweet look, as if reading her new friend's mind. A few days passed in which Victoria seemed to adapt splendidly to the routine of Brockett Hall, and to her work as governess of Lizzie, the little girl adored her. Also in those days Victoria received the orchids that Lord Melbourne promised her and every time a footman gave her an orchid on orders from Lord Melbourne, she smiled and sighed. Lord Melbourne was looking for opportunities to talk to her, and he was always so charming and funny, and Victoria's heart always quickened when he appeared or when he kissed her hand and gave her an intense look. One day, Lord Melbourne approached her in the middle of two classes from Victoria to Lizzie. Victoria, said Lord Melbourne, looking from side to side to see that no one was listening so that he could simply call her by her name, I wanted to ask you something. Yes, of course Lord M., Victoria replied with a friendly smile, as she also looked sideways with slyness. You'll see, Victoria. It's just that I was planning to go with Lizzie later to take a walk and do some shopping, and I'd like you to join us, Lord Melbourne said a little nervously, like a boy asking a date to a girl he likes. Me? said Victoria, surprised and timid. Yes, what happens Victoria, is that as you also teach protocol to Lizzie would be convenient to occasionally accompany us to some rides so that she learns from you example how a young lady should behave in public, of course the lady Lazen instilled very good manners in her, but she is an old lady and does not know how young women behave in today's high society. Besides, Lizzie is very fond of you and your presence would make the ride more pleasant, Lord Melbourne told her. I understand, Lord Melbourne. Lord M., I'll be ready when you say, Victoria answered helpfully and a little nervous. Magnificent. Please wear your best dress. See you later, Victoria, replied Lord Melbourne enthusiastically. Lord Melbourne left happily and enthusiastically. Victoria watched him leave, then saw her own dress with a certain embarrassment. But this is my best dress, Victoria said to herself. A couple of hours later, Lord Melbourne, Victoria and Lizzie were travelling by car getting into London. On a crowded street in a sumptuous area, full of elegant shops, the three of them got out of the car and took a walk. Lizzie was holding Lord Melbourne's hand, and Victoria walked beside them. The three of them chatted happily and laughed at the occurrences of the little girl and the jokes of Lord Melbourne. But at one point two girls of Victoria's age, dressed elegantly, proving they were young women from wealthy families, saw Victoria as a weirdo, and whispered among them, then giggling. The indiscreet gesture did not go unnoticed by Lord Melbourne and Victoria, and as Lord Melbourne looked angry, Victoria had a gesture of shame and sadness on her face. Lord Melbourne looked up at something and when he saw it, he hastened to Victoria to follow him while pulling Lizzie. Then they entered a large store, very luxurious and with large windows, a women's clothing store. Excuse me, miss, may I speak to the shopkeeper? Please tell him it's from Lord. Said Lord Melbourne to a young maid. Lord Melbourne. I know perfectly well who it is, Lord Melbourne. Please Lucy, 
go and see how you can help those ladies, said a mature but attractive, thin, tall woman, very elegant, who saw Lord Melbourne with refined and subtle coquetry. Have we met yet, ma'am? asked Lord Melbourne. Jacobs, Claire Mary Jacobs. And yes, we met at a couple of social events, and one of them introduced us to our mutual friend Emma Portman, replied the woman. Of course, Mrs. Jacobs, pardon my bad mind. I'm at your feet lady, Lord Melbourne said, kissing Lady Jacobs's hand gallantly, while Victoria watched the scene with a small shadow of jealousy on her face. To what do I owe your pleasant visit to my shop, Lord Melbourne? asked Mrs. Jacobs charmingly. Well, Mrs. Jacobs, she is Miss Victoria Edwards, and we would like a wardrobe for her, Lord Melbourne said, pointing to Victoria. Lord Melbourne, no! exclaimed Victoria, shocked and scandalized. You wait, Miss Victoria, please allow me a minute, please you show Lizzie some of those wonderful suits while I have a little conversation with Mrs. Jacobs said Lord Melbourne and Victoria obediently she took Lizzie aside so that Lord Melbourne could talk to Mrs. Jacobs alone. Mrs. Jacobs, may I ask you a favor? Lord Melbourne asked with a seductive smile to Mrs. Jacobs. Of course Lord Melbourne! exclaimed Mrs. Jacobs, intrigued. Imagine there was a terrible fire in Buckingham Palace. God forbid! Lord Melbourne continued. God forbid! Of course," replied Mrs. Jacobs. But imagine that that happened, and that in that fire burn all the clothes of Queen Victoria, each and every one of her costumes, and that suddenly our Queen would be left without a wardrobe. Now imagine that the Queen resorts to you to replenish her wardrobe, buying her new clothes to you. Well, I want you to do something with Miss Victoria, because she also needs a whole new wardrobe. And of course, I am willing to run with all the expenses, said Lord Melbourne. Of course Lord Melbourne, but exactly how many suits are we talking about? That is, how extensive does that wardrobe want? asked Mrs. Jacobs. Well, I do not have an exact idea, but I do have a rough idea of the budget I want to spend on this enterprise. This is only an advance, I am willing to pay two or three times this amount, or even more for Miss Victoria to have a distinguished and diverse wardrobe," said Lord Melbourne drawing from a pocket of his jacket a bundle of banknotes of high denomination and delivering them to Mrs. Jacobs. Lord Melbourne. I see, in that case I guarantee that the young lady will have the best wardrobe in all London except the Queen, of course, replied Mrs. Jacobs excited to see so much money. I would also like you to serve as an intermediary so that other distinguished merchants like you could provide Miss Victoria with the other things she needs, such as shoes and hats, naturally I will be just as generous with others, and you will receive an extra for the annoyance," added Lord Melbourne. Do not worry, Lord Melbourne, I'll take care of the young lady personally, said Mrs. Jacobs. Thank you, Mrs. Jacobs said Lord Melbourne kissing her hand again with chivalry, with your permission. Lord Melbourne turned away from Mrs. Jacobs and approached Victoria, who was in another corner of the store with Lizzie. Lord Melbourne, please, I cannot allow you to do this, Victoria said, embarrassed. Do what, Victoria? asked Lord Melbourne, pretending to be innocent. Buy clothes for me, Lord Melbourne. My salary is not enough to pay even one of the costumes they sell here, and I cannot accept your charity," Victoria said hurt. Charity. Miss Victoria disappoints me, Lord Melbourne replied in a pretended reproach. Me? Victoria answered, confused and somewhat fearful. Of course. It offends me and offends you by calling charity to what we are doing here. You will see, Miss Victoria. This is the first time you work in an aristocratic house, and I must explain some things that you do not know. In Brockett Hall we have an intense social life, and in certain seasons of the year we receive many illustrious visitors, and also I go to social events with my niece. And very often you must accompany us or you must be present, as Lizzie's governess, taking care of her and you teaching her the necessary protocol. Therefore, 
it is necessary, no, it is mandatory, that you dress well. Because your image also reflects the image of my family, my home. I cannot, in any way, allow you to dress inadequately for your duties, Lord Melbourne said in the tone of polite and respectful, but firm, scolding he used with Victoria when she was queen in the other reality, and she was committing some lack to their duties. Excuse me, Lord Melbourne, I did not know. Victoria replied, puzzled and somewhat embarrassed. You must understand that the visitors to Brockett Hall or the people we frequent outside our house. Replied Lord Melbourne. But Uncle William, we. Interrupted Lizzie, who did not understand why her uncle said that, if in Brockett Hall they received few visits and did not go to social events. My dear, if you let me speak to Miss Victoria without interruption, I'll buy you a new doll, and then I'll take you to buy ice cream or rich sweets, Lord Melbourne told her. Hurrah! Lizzie exclaimed contentedly. As I was saying to you, Miss Victoria, it is a question of how you dress also represents my image in front of society, as governess of my niece. So that clothing will actually be like work uniforms for you. That is why it is a little irritating that you think it is charity, I value your excellent work with my niece, so much so as not to treat you like a beggar, said Lord Melbourne exaggerating his displeasure somewhat. I... I do not know what to say, excuse me my lord, but I did not know that. Victoria replied nervous and embarrassed, afraid to have angered his beloved employer. Do not worry, I'll accept your apologies, Lord Melbourne replied with an affectionate smile, though Victoria had not apologized exactly, and then went on talking, Lizzie, let's go get that doll and that ice cream. Miss Victoria, you stay here for Mrs. Jacobs to do her job. Mrs. Jacobs, how long will it take you? with Miss Victoria for to know when to come for her? Lord Melbourne will be enough for an hour, Mrs. Jacobs said with her charming smile. Well, Miss Victoria, I'll be back for you, in an hour, said Lord Melbourne, then took Lizzie's hand, let's go for your doll and your sweets, Lizzie. The little girl jumped joyfully and was carried away by her uncle. But I, Victoria said, puzzled, not understanding what had happened. Well, Miss Victoria, please follow me, we have no time to lose, Mrs. Jacobs said in a kind but somewhat firm tone, like a teacher to her pupil. Victoria followed her into a room where they had intimacy. My dear, please get undressed, and you stay alone with the underwear, Mrs. Jacobs asked. Victoria, somewhat embarrassed and flushed, took off her clothes slowly, while Mrs. Jacobs left and then returned with two maids. My goodness! Miss Victoria, were you in a papist convent? Said Mrs. Jacobs a little theatrical. No. Why? Victoria asked in surprise and bewilderment. It's just that your underwear looks like a nun's underwear. Exclaimed Mrs. Jacobs, speaking very seriously, apparently. I thought was pretty, Victoria said quietly, looking at her own underwear. It will not be sexy for a man, Miss Victoria, Mrs. Jacobs replied. Madam, I am a single woman. No man sees me in my underwear, Victoria protested politely, but a little angry and offended. Of course. Replied Mrs. Jacobs with veiled irony and a certain skepticism, let's see, it has a very pretty face, like of little girl, beautiful eyes, her hair too, a favorable color of skin. We have a good material here, Mrs. Jacobs went on clinically analyzing Victoria, as if she were a person interested in buying a mare and to examine it in detail in order to decide. Victoria looked in a mirror and was flattered by what Mrs. Jacobs said. She also has a beautiful body, but unfortunately she has a very short stature, Mrs. Jacobs continued her analysis. They've told me that many times before, Victoria said between her teeth sadly but still has a nice silhouette, a slim body and pretty, with reasonably attractive attributes, a body fit to wear many elegant and sexy dresses, particularly favor the colors red, blue and green. Well, let's do it. Lucy, the measures, soon.
and be very careful when taking the them, as always, concluded Mrs. Jacobs giving orders to one of her employees. While an employee was taking Victoria's measures, Mrs. Jacobs was talking to two other employees apart. You go to Mrs. Johnson, from the shoe store, and tell her we have an important client who will need several pairs of shoes, if she is interested in making good money, first find out the number of Miss Victoria's footwear, and tell her Mrs. Johnson to send some of your employees to my store with some pairs of shoes, some of the most expensive ones. Come on, hurry up. Said Mrs. Jacobs, and while the maid was about to do her bidding, she went on talking to the other maid, and you, get some sets of underwear for Miss Victoria, the sexiest and most daring we have. We always have to please a good customer. I thought the lady liked the kind of underwear she wears, the maid said. The customer is the one who pays, do not forget, the one who pays, Mrs. Jacobs replied with mischief and irony, with a mischievous smile assuming that Victoria was Lord Melbourne's lover. The hour passed quickly, in the midst of an exhaustive work of Mrs. Jacobs and her servants, who left Victoria weary and somewhat overwhelmed. When Lord Melbourne arrived at the store with Lizzie holding hands, the little girl carrying her new wrist under her arm, an employee hurried to call Mrs. Jacobs, who helpfully went to welcome Lord Melbourne. Lord Melbourne, I think you will be satisfied. We have obtained several suits suitable for Miss Victoria, we will work on them and on others more than I have in mind, and you can order to pick them up within two days. Meanwhile, there are already three suits that have fitted perfectly and you can see to her now with one. Before Lord Melbourne could say anything, Victoria stepped out of the room with a beautiful little blue suit that looked perfect on her body. Lord Melbourne was absorbed, remembering how beautiful Victoria looked in her role as queen. You look very pretty Victoria. Lizzie exclaimed cheerfully. Thank you, Lizzie. Victoria replied with a sweet smile. You really look very beautiful, Miss Victoria, said Lord Melbourne, sincerely surrendered to her beauty. Thank you, Lord Melbourne. Victoria thanked, very blushing. After a brief conversation between Lord Melbourne and Mrs. Jacobs to agree on the details of their business, he went out with Lizzie and Victoria. And then Lord Melbourne offered his arm to Victoria. Come on, Miss Victoria, in your attire it would be a crime on my part to let her walk down the street beside me without offering you my arm, Lord Melbourne said, charmingly. Of course, Lord Melbourne, Victoria said, gripping Lord Melbourne's arm, her other hand carrying Lizzie's hand. Walking the three on the street like that, they looked like a family, a marriage to their daughter. What a beautiful couple! said one lady to another. True, though he seems a little older to her, but since he's so handsome that makes up for the difference in age, the other lady replied. But she's so young. I do not think the little girl can be hers, said the first lady. Maybe he's a newly married widower again, and the young lady is the little girl's stepmother, replied the second lady. Another pair of ladies in another corner of the street also noticed them. Is not that Lord Melbourne? I did not know he was remarried, said one of the women. Well, if it is like that, he chose a woman much younger than him and very beautiful, although he is still very handsome. Victoria noticed some glances of curiosity and sympathy. Many of them see us, Lord Melbourne, Victoria said a little sheepishly. Of course. I am accompanied by a beautiful young woman. They will wonder if it is my wife, and they will think that I am so fortunate," replied Lord Melbourne, unable to conceal his happiness with a broad smile. Victoria blushed again and laughed a little, with a cheerful and charming laugh. Lord Melbourne and Lizzie also laughed. When they returned to Brockett Hall, the three of them were very happy, but soon Victoria had to endure the suspicious somewhat disgusted looks of Mrs. Lazen, but she did not say anything out of respect for her employer's decisions. In the following days Lord Melbourne moved closer to Victoria, and he saw that she was growing happier in her new home and that she enjoyed the company of him. However, he also noticed that sometimes she seemed a little sad, and sometimes he caught her crying alone.
Lord Melbourne did not understand the reason until one day he saw Victoria crying in silence as she watched Lizzie play with her pet, a beautiful white cat. For him it was like an illumination. The next day Lord Melbourne left Brockett Hall early and returned past noon, with much stealth, hiding something with the complicity of a servant. In the afternoon Lord Melbourne asked her to talk to her alone, in his library. Victoria, I was in the Lowood Institution today, Lord Melbourne told him. At Lowood? I do not understand, my lord, did I do something wrong? Victoria asked thwarted. No. On the contrary. I went to make a generous donation to the institution to thank for your services, and to improve the quality of life of other young ladies like you, so that they have the opportunity to put their lives on a better path. If, all of Lowood's graduates are like you, it's worth supporting that institution, Lord Melbourne answered truthfully. Thank you Lord Melbourne. I am honoured and grateful, and Lowood girls will thank you as well said Victoria excited and proud of her work. You still have trouble calling me Lord M. exclaimed amused Lord Melbourne. I'm ashamed Lord. Lord M. Victoria answered with a giggle. I understand, well, but that was not the only reason I went to Lowood. The other day I had a revelation seeing you, and I understood that a part of you stayed in Lowood and that's why you could not be entirely happy. That's why I went there too, Lord Melbourne said. A part of me? I do not understand. Victoria replied, puzzled, but she felt her heart racing. You wait a moment and you'll understand, he answered. Lord Melbourne went to a door to go to an adjoining room, and when he returned he did not go alone. He was carrying a Cavalier King Charles Spaniel dog. Dash. Victoria exclaimed excitedly and ran to Lord Melbourne who put the dog in her arms, while Dash licked Victoria's face frantically, but how? She added with tears of happiness. I do not know why, but when I saw you staring at Lizzie with her cat, I imagined you were sad because at Lowood you would have a very dear pet that you had, that you left and that you missed. Said Lord Melbourne, speaking a half-truth because in reality he deduced that in that reality Victoria could continue to have her faithful friend and inseparable companion, and he was not wrong, they told me when I asked if you had a pet, that years ago one of the ladies benefactor of the institution and was very fond of you, gave you this beautiful dog, who was the son of a female dog of that lady, and asked the managers to let you keep it, but when you came to Brockett Hall you had to leave it to one of your friends in the institution, but you do not have to suffer any more, I'll talk to Mrs. Lazen and you'll be able to keep your friend, concluded Lord Melbourne. Seriously? Thank you very much Lord M. Victoria exclaimed with exultation, and without thinking she approached Lord Melbourne and stood on tiptoe and kissed him on the cheek. Lord Melbourne looked astonished and then blissfully, and Victoria was ashamed of her outburst and her face turned red. Sorry Lord Melbourne. I did not want to be disrespectful, I'm so happy, apologized Victoria distressed. Do not worry. I'm also very happy to put a smile on your beautiful and sweet face, Lord Melbourne answered sincerely happy, and took one of her hands, to give her a gallant kiss on the back of her hand. A few minutes later Victoria was lying on her bed, hugging Dash. She closed her eyes and ran her fingers over her lips remembering the kiss she gave Lord Melbourne. Lord M. My dear Dash, I'm afraid my heart is no longer yours alone. Next Chapter Chapter 5, Conversation in the Brothel and Street Fight in Brockett Hall